Florence Chadwick, swimmer, was the first woman, American swimmer, to swim across the English Channel and back in 1952. But she wanted to swim across the Pacific. On a cold, foggy day, with a rowboat next to her, with her mom and some guys that were there to shoot sharks, she stepped into the water. Swimming across the Pacific. She had her protection. She had, her, she, she had prepared. And she and her team, her rowboat, stepped into the water on that cold and foggy morning in 1952. She began to swim, stroke after stroke after stroke. As a matter of fact, 16 hours she swam. The estimate on the strokes was 67,000 stroke after stroke after stroke. And at that point, at 67,001, she said, pull me in. Like, like, she just indicated, I'm done. Pull me in. And her mother said, you keep going. You keep going. You're almost there. You keep going. Don't quit. She did. She kept going for a while. And then she stopped. The fog was too thick. She couldn't see anything around her, basically. All that was up in here was the fog and another stroke. It's too foggy. She was informed later that she was about half a mile away from the shore. In an interview afterwards, discussing what happened why she was pulled in the boat or whatever, her experience. This is her quote. All I could see was fog. I think if I, had, if I could have just seen the shore, I would have made it. If I could have just seen the shore, I would have made it. I mean, I wonder how many of you this morning... All you can see is fog. You've heard about a shore. You know that there's one theoretically coming, but it doesn't seem to touch your reality. And you're like on 67,001, and you're asking people around you, pull me in. I'm done. I can't keep going. I probably would have finished if I just could have seen the shore. I'm wondering today about what storms that you might be walking through. This was not the planned message for today, by the way. This is for you. You came in today. I don't know why you came in. I don't know what you brought it. We got a cool series that I was all amped up and ready to go today. And it was like the Lord had been speaking to my soul and then said, this is what you've got to preach. Just FYI. I wonder what storm you brought in here with you today. Like, what does your fog look like? Maybe some of you are enduring the storm of singleness. And you're like, man, I can't take another stroke of this reality. Maybe some of you are enduring the storm of a difficult marriage. And it's like, pull me out. And maybe some of you are enduring the storm of parenting young children. And it's awesome and it's a joy, but there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of, is this ever going to end? Don't tell me not to blink again because I can't even sleep, so that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Overdramatic. Maybe some of you are enduring the storm of parenting a child who has gone. And you have no relationship with them. 
or you were taken away. And that relationship is on hold at best. Maybe some of you are, are enduring the storm of caring for aging parents. And you've never been there before and now you are the caretaker and all you can see is fog. Maybe it's, maybe it's unemployment. Uh, maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's depression or anxiety. Maybe it's rejection. Like you've taken a step out for your faith in your family or at your workplace and all you're re experiencing now is opposition. I want to let you know you are welcome here. We love that you are here, and I believe that God just wants to share a bit of his heart with you today, specifically as you endure and look, hopefully, beyond the fog. As a reading plan, our church has been in 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be today. And um, I've been trying to follow along. I, I'm not, I don't have perfect attendance by any stretch of the imagination. But it's a really cool place. Sometimes when I read my Bible, I'm like, I'm not sure where I'm going to read. I like the old. I like the new. I can, but it's been cool to have a reading plan so that like, I can just open the link and be like, okay, we're in 2 Corinthians. It's just kind of cool to, to do that and, and have that there. And to even think that some of you might be doing that with us is, is a really, really fun thing. And so as a church, as a reading plan, we've been in 2 Corinthians and uh, 1 Corinthians uh, is a letter to the church in Corinth where Paul is just address addressing a bunch of like chaos. They're just, it's like kind of church gone bad, and he's, he's helping out. 2 Corinthians, you start to hear more of this theme of endurance. Now, it's not the only theme, but in chapter 1, you see some contagious endurance. And, and so when, what I mean by contagious con in endurance in, in chapter 1 is that... Um, he, he writes, he starts off this letter, and, and there's the greeting, but then he, he gets into um, this idea that uh, as, as they've experienced trials, it's not just been for, the, for them and their own endurance, but that like their endurance has mattered for the endurance of other people. Okay, and so he says, like, we got comforted by God as we walked through our affliction, and it wasn't just for us, it was so that we could then share that with you guys. So we got comforted, not just so that we would feel better and have the presence of Christ, although those are great gifts, it was so that we could then give it away to people who were walking through a very similar thing. And so there's this idea where, where endurance, and I was, as I was reading, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me like, dude, you have underestimated endurance. You've underestimated, like, the power of endurance. And, and as you walk through your trials, Casey, it's not just so that you and I become more intimate and you make much of the name of me just in your own personal story. It's so that you can become contagious with my name to other people who walk through the similar brokenness that you do. Don't underestimate the power of endurance. It's like, you're not, I'm not just enduring, you're not just enduring for the sake of your family, or for the sake of the small group you lead, or for the sake of the model, your witness at work. There are other people who are being encouraged and are enduring because they're watching you endure. It's like, if that dude can keep showing up, then I guess I can keep showing up. So I haven't preached in a little while, so I got a little, I have like four bent up sermons in me, I think, so... I'm coming in hot, and I don't have a lot of time because there's kids, and so, all right. Some of you like that. Some of you are like, why is he yelling the whole time? Oh, no. <laughs> chapter 2, or chapter 6. Hey, um, don't miss this. Uh, this is what part, of, part of what God was telling me this week. Um, like, there's real power in showing up no matter what you bring to the event. There's real power in, in showing up at home over and over and over again, no matter how you feel. There's real power for me to show up even when my mind's swirling and my chest is pounding and my stomach is out of control again. And I know it's a gospel issue and I know what I believe, but it's not seeming to touch the anxiousness that I'm walking through. There's real power in me just showing up again and saying, all right, I guess I'll just give the broken jar of clay that I am to this situation and hope, Holy Spirit, that you can make more of it because it doesn't seem to be all, all, all the things that I want to be before I show up in this moment. There's real power in how you continue to show up 
over and over and over again. So keep showing up. Chapter 6, the letter continues and we begin to see some active endurance. Active endurance, and Paul starts to talk about various trials. And then this is, if you're familiar with the letter, this is when he's like, man, um, it's really hard. It's, this, is, this is a summary. It's super hard. We're not dead yet. So we, we, we're going to keep going. We, we're going we're gonna to keep showing up. We can keep, keep showing up. It's really hard. And as a matter of fact, he starts that passage, and he talks about some things that go along with, like, ministry and gospel gospel messaging and things like that, but the first word is afflictions. And, and the commentator that I was reading was saying, like, afflictions is also, like, it includes just general afflictions of being in a jar of clay. I love that term. Because he's like, you've got this precious, this precious message and ministry of the gospel proclaiming Jesus, and here's what God is saying. I put it in a jar of clay. <laughs> it's great. You thought I was going to put it in a vessel of gold where there were some diamonds on the outside, and it always worked right. But I put it in this jar of clay, and it's got cracks in it, and it's, it's just like a real, it's a real common thing. Because what it does is it makes much of the uncommon message that lives in the common thing. Are you with me? It makes much of Jesus when we're actually the, the jars of clay that we are. So if you're here today and you're like trying to not be a jar of clay, you're like, I can't stand the clay. You're trying to like shine it up and hope that it shines. And it should get, Listen, it'll work for a second. Like you can actually shine it up for a second and it'll work. But then you know what you have to do? You can't really be real with anybody because you've got to run back over here and keep shining it up. Because you're really a jar of clay. So just be who you are and let Jesus be who he is. And in this particular chapter, we begin to learn about um, it's, it, this idea of active endurance. And so it's not endurance that looks like this. It's not endurance that looks like this. Well, I'm just like waiting and enduring the storm. Like, we would, we would call somebody probably like unwise who knew the storm was coming and didn't do anything. We'd be like, we'd even call them unwise if, if, we were like, if they're like, okay, well, I'm just, I'm just believing in the Lord. And I know it's a five, and I know it has my street address on it. <laughs> but now listen, there's some people who can't do anything. They're, I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about people who, who had the means to do something, and they just sat there and they called it like, I'm going to endure this storm. That, that's not biblical. That's not gospel-oriented. Um, that's S-T-U-P-I-D <laughs> for those of you with kids in the room. There, there's actually, do you know, the, you know what Paul says about how grace affected him? He's like, he's like I, basically, I, I didn't receive grace in vain. As a matter of fact, grace did something to me, and I ended up working harder than the rest. So grace isn't opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Now, I'm quoting somebody there that I can't remember, so don't think I made that up. But it's true. Active endurance through various trials. Check this out. The ancient Greek word, uh, well, I, I can't really pronounce it, so whatever. Uh, the active Greek word does not describe the frame of mind which can sit down with folded hands and bowed head and let a torrent of troubles sweep over it, it with passive resignation. It describes the ability to bear things in such a triumphant way that it transfigures them, says Barclay, the commentator. All right, chapter 4. Open your Bibles. Chapter 4. Chapter 4. So Paul's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and this is what he has to say um, to that particular audience and then with application to us as well. Remember, the Bible wasn't with, the Bible's not written with you as the first audience, okay? There's, there's an actual contextual audience. We want to do, do justice to the passage, but then there's application to you, okay? And so let's, let's, let's do that. And so um, chapter 4, we learned something about what's called, what, I, what I think is called doable endurance. Doable endurance. So you know about active endurance, and you know about um, contagious endurance. 
and you can see some themes starting to happen here, but if you're like me, man, I got to know that I can do this. Tell me what to do as I pursue Jesus with endurance. Like I got, what am I supposed to do? If I'm not supposed to do that, what is it that I am supposed to do? And thankfully, the word of God is good for all situations, equipping and reproving and correcting everyone so we actually know what to do. And chapter six, or chapter uh, four here is the doable thing. It's, I, this would be like, I kind of want to say it's the secret to endurance, but I don't know. That just makes me sound like I've got something really important to say. So I'll just say it's the doable thing to endurance. It's like, man, I can get my head around this. And then now I know that when all I can see is the fog, now I'll know what to do. All right, are you with me? All right, cool, let's go. So, so Paul gets down here in the middle of the, of the passage of, of chapter 4, and man, he's, he's talking about the, the fact that this, this thing is, uh, we're proclaiming Jesus, and, and you know, this is the jars of clay, actual passage here, and um, it, uh, this, this chapter, and there's a surpassing power that belongs to him, and that's where all that gets kind of fleshed out. This is the chapter where he's like, it's difficult. I'm sorry, I said that was chapter 6. It's actually chapter 4. This is the chapter where he says it's difficult but not impossible, and then he says this. So we do not lose heart. I just want to read that again. I want these words to wash over you. Ready? So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction, afflictions, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Somebody say amen to that, please. Amen. Let me just start here. So we do not lose heart. I love that. I love coaching. I love coaching. I'm not sure about my preaching or my leading or all the other things that I'm called to do in life right now, but I love to coach. Like, it was part of my old life, and actually the older I get, it's, it's harder to kind of get amped up because I remember, like, how passionate I used to be about coaching. Uh, but I, coaching is like a, is a beautiful thing. It resonates with my heart. And what Paul is doing here is he's coaching us up. And he starts off by saying, don't lose heart. Look at me. If I identified with any of you, on those storms. I need your eyes just for a minute. And I want, I want to tell you what the Lord has to tell you today. Do not lose heart. Don't do it. Now let's look at how. How? Because there's no good coach that's going to say, just win, baby, win, and not give you the plan, and not give you the strategy. So God gives us the strategy. He gives the strategy to the church in Corinth. He gives the strategy to the Corinthians first who might lose heart, who might get caught in the fog of this new ministry of proclaiming Jesus in the midst of the world where they are. He tells them first, don't lose heart. And then today he tells us, don't lose heart. So how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Can we get that second slide? There's only two slides today. As we look. As we look. All right, so here in the passage, he's like, listen, it starts off really awesome. It's like a bracelet you could wear, bumper sticker, poster, don't lose heart. Got that. Even though our outer self is wasting away, okay, so things aren't working the way they should. We're, this, this body, all this stuff doesn't, it's not perfected, it's not supposed to be. Um, the, the, the stuff that you're walking through, it's light and momentary. And what that means, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that any of the storms are easy. It just means when you compare them in light of what is to come in eternity, when you compare them to God and the gift of him himself, that puts perspective on them. I am radically strong and, and like, aggressive and can flip upside down my four-year-old. I'm like a beast around that kid. When we wrestle, he knows who the dominator is. 
okay? It, it's on, like all in fun, right? But listen, in that perspective, to Cade, I'm a beast. <laughs> I don't know how this is coming across online, but whatever beasts do, right, I, that's me. But, you know, like I could get around John O'Brien. I could get around Travis. I could, I could pretty much get around anyone on our staff, and I'm, not, I'm no beast anymore. I'm like, Scrawny Casey, hey, need a little help over here. Can't lift my backpack. Can you guys give me it? Perspectively, he's helping them to say, hey, what's happening right now in perspective? Huh? You're almost there. You're almost there. If I could have just seen the shore, I would have made it. All I could see was fog. I think if I could have just seen the shore, I would have made it. He goes on in the passage and he says, listen, um, there, there, there's something that's happening with the afflictions. Okay, six minutes. I got this. I'm going to keep going. There's something that's happening in the affliction. You ready? Here's what that means. And there's no way I can preach it like John Piper does, so, so look up John Piper on what afflictions and hardship are doing. But I'm going to give my, my best. Hmm. You know your addiction and your unemployment and your marriage and your singleness and your anxiousness and your depression, it's doing something. God is taking it and he's doing something something with it, none of it, not one moment of it, for a follower of Jesus Christ is wasted suffering. What is he doing with it? Preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's amazing news. I don't, you know what's even better? I can't explain what that means. You don't want a preacher to be able to explain what all of the Bible means or it would just be another book. There's some mystery to what's on the shore. Like, I can't explain it until I get there, but when I get there, I'm going to be like, thank you for my anxious heart. Thank you for that storm. Thank you that I had to walk through that because I have this experience, which is more of you, that I would not have had had I not walked through that. This is not a license to sin. This is not a like, well, well I'm just going to get myself in a bunch of trouble because I get good stuff on the other side. We do not take grace for vain. We do not receive grace in vain. But it is a reminder to those of you who are walking through whatever storm you brought in here, there is a shore that I can't explain it to you because it's that good. So you don't lose heart. Well, how? How? That's really helpful today. And maybe, maybe there's kind of like, a, oh, that's a great, I needed to hear that today. But check this out. Tuesday morning is coming. Thursday night is coming. Friday night when you go home and there's no one there is coming. So how do I do this? We look to the passage and it says this, verse 18. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. As we look. Here's, I think, what Jesus wants you to hear today. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to keep your eyes open. On Jesus. You want to know the doable part of endurance? You've got to find Jesus. Do whatever it takes. He is very available, but he will not be found like this. He will not be found with your Bibles closed, 
with you coming in and out of church and fellowship. He will not be found with you having one foot in and one foot out where I'm going to pursue my flesh over here today, but today now I'm going to come back and pursue Jesus. He will not be found by you isolating. He's very accessible. Today is the day of salvation. But you have to do it. You have to walk in it. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to you thinking you're going to earn something. But do not mistake the availability of Jesus with thinking, well, I don't need to do anything now. No, it's grace that actually compels you to pursue Jesus. Christ went to a cross and he took your sin and he took my sin. There's no greater love story, including my 23 years of beautiful marriage or my parents, I don't know how many, but a lot of years of marriage. Or your, Those are all great stories. They pale in comparison to the God of the universe saying, I will take the sin of Casey that should separate you, Father, from him. Crush me in his place. Pour out all your wrath. I'll die. And on the third day, he takes back his life. The comeback story of eternity, having defeated my sin, having absorbed my death and the penalty, and saying, Casey, just come and receive it. Just believe. Just turn from yourself and let me be your savior by faith. There's no love story like the gospel that can compel you to endure. What does endurance look like? Interesting, I was uh, meeting, I'm in a DNA, and um, I was meeting with, with uh, my, my buddy here in the DNA, and I was asking him, he's actually a trainer and, um, in, in the field, I said, hey, uh, like, I forget how I, how I labeled the question, but it was like, how do, who, who does the best in your, in your field of fitness? He told me, heart patients and, and like people who have cancer, they do the best when it comes to endurance. You know why? Because they were told by an authority they're going to die if they don't do this. Like you have a chance at living, but you have a heart condition. And if you do this, you get to live. If you do this, you get to walk your daughter down the aisle. If you do this, you get to see your grandkids live and flourish. and You get to be around. They're the winners in the world of enduring fitness because they know, watch, watch, watch. They know that it's a life or death matter. And so they're not late. And they don't cancel. And they don't double book. And they don't, and they don't, and they don't, and they don't because all of those the, all of those things are simply a manifestation of the fact that that person didn't want it bad enough. But when you know your life's on the line, you do whatever it takes to get to that gym. Avenue Church, your life is on the line. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about earning anything. I'm talking about your spiritual endurance. Watch me. Your spiritual endurance is on the line. You have to do whatever it takes to keep your eyes on Jesus. Or you will get lost in the fog and asked to come in the boat. We've all seen it. We've seen it happen in this church. We've seen it happen in the church. It's that important. What does that look like? There's nothing I'm going to wow you with, okay? Just like put your wow meters way down when I tell you what this looks like and, and the doable nature of it. Do whatever it takes to look at Jesus in his word. I don't know how you're going to endure if you're not regularly reading the word. I don't know how you're going to do it. The fog is so thick in my life that if I don't have regular time in the Word, I'm not going to endure. So do whatever it takes 
to get in the Word. You're not a morning person. Hmm. So it's okay. It's cool. Do whatever it takes to get in the Word. You need eight hours. You don't get it. You don't have one. Watch. <laughs> Do whatever it takes to look at Jesus in his word. I don't care if you've got to go to bed earlier. I don't care if you've got to lose out on some sleep. I don't care if, if it doesn't make sense over and over and over again. I, I, don't, I don't care if, if you, don't, you don't get it. I don't care if you don't have a word. I, like, I, when I mean I don't care doesn't mean I don't care about you. I just don't care about your excuse. Because I don't want to be in the boat when you ask to come out. I don't, want, I don't want to see that happen. I don't want you to look at me and say, get me out of the water, I'm done. I don't want to see that. So do whatever you have to do to look at Jesus in his word. I don't care if it's 15 minutes. I don't care if it's 45 minutes. Whatever it is. Do whatever it takes to get in the Word. Do whatever it takes to get in worship. There is, at least in my, in my situation as I've walked through life, there's something that happens when I worship. And, oh, I'm thinking of another cool quote that I don't know the person for. John, I wish you were up here preaching this sermon with me. Because then I could, we could do this. Thing. But there's somebody who talks about worship interrupting our preoccupation with self. Right? Does it mean no? He's like, I don't know either. I think somebody amazingly smart out there said that worship interrupts our preoccupation with self. You know we live like this a lot. So praise the Lord. Oh, did you get hurt? Sorry. I didn't even see you there. Oh, I can't, and I can't, because I'm here. I'm here. Here's what worship does. Worship, it, it interrupts that. It interrupts that. And what worship does for me is it clears the fog. It doesn't all go away. I'm still foggy and cold. Even with my hands held high, when I'm telling Jesus who he is, it's still foggy and cold sometimes. It's just that I start to see things that I couldn't see before. Like the fog starts to lift, and I start to be reminded of who he is and who I am. And then I start to get courageous, and I start to have all these crazy bad ideas that are actually God ideas. And then all of a sudden... Like the kingdom of God starts coming around me and the same thing will happen through you. You know me. You know, you know what kind of jar of clay I am. If you don't, just ask somebody who's been here like a minute. Do whatever it takes to look at Jesus in prayer. Team, we got to come up. I know we got to end here. We're going to try to honor, honor our time together. Do whatever it takes. You don't know how to pray. It just, I didn't know how to talk to my wife at the beginning. Our first date, we ate nachos. And it was like super weird and awkward. And then we had another day, and then we had another day. And then I learned what it was to talk to my wife. Check this out. The life of my marriage depends on our communication. You know that, right? Like if we were like just couldn't talk to each other, like how, would, how would our hearts connect? Do whatever it takes to look at Jesus in community. I'm going to be kind to you who want me to pick this up. Pick this up right now. Do whatever it takes to look at Jesus in community. We're launching these small groups. And you're like, I'm too busy. I got this, I got this. Like, I get it, man. I get it, I get it. This is not a guilt trip, by the way. This is just like, hey, it's life and death, okay? It's life and death. And I no longer want to be a part of watching people bounce into the boat and out of the race because I didn't play my role, which is get in community. Do whatever it takes. You need the community of God. Because we cannot continue to look at Jesus by ourselves. We weren't created that way. God himself Father, Son, Holy Spirit is in community and he calls us into that community so that I can hear somebody like Florence's mother say, keep going. 
every Wednesday for like an hour and a half to two hours. I've got this buddy, and you've heard his name's there. You know what he's done for like the last 18 years? I'm going to paraphrase it. He says, Casey, I love you. Keep going. I know, it's, I know you think it's so hard to be you. Keep going. Get your, come on, come on, give me your, look, at, look up, look up, look up. Keep going. Here's what I think Jesus was telling me, and I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come, and we're going to have a moment of response, and I, you know, this may be a moment where, like, the Lord has just kind of spoken some stuff to you, and you need to speak some stuff back to him, or you need somebody to, to pray into existence what God has been speaking to you. So if we have members from our prayer team, come on up here to the front, and we're going to sing this song, and we want to be able to pray over you, share what you want endurance in or through, and we're going to trust that as we lay hands and pray on you, God's, God's going to just do something really sweet and awesome because that's how he's like ordained prayer. is like a real thing where God does stuff through it. And so don't miss that opportunity. Here's what Jesus has been telling me. And then the storm came and I'm like, okay, I got to preach it. Just as lovingly as he can, he's been saying, Casey, I need your eyes. You ever get with one of your kids and they're not really paying attention? They're like caught up in whatever they're doing. And you're trying to communicate something really important. And you're like, eyes, give me your eyes. I need your eyes. I don't know why, but I, I just, I feel, it's not a full pity party, but I was kind of feeling like a pity semi-celebration for myself the last week or a, week and a half. I don't know. I was like, oh, wow, I'm really clayish. <laughs> like I was into my clayness more than I was into my Jesus kind of thing. Have you ever gotten there? It's cool to know you're broken. It's just not cool to worship your brokenness. There's a Savior who has and is making you whole. And so here's what Jesus, he's like, Casey, I need your, <laughs> I need your eyes, man. Like I, like I need your, I, I, don't, I need your eyes, Casey. And, and so I, like when I get down on my kid's level and I, 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 get, I get in their face and, and we're able to have some intimacy, I feel like in his, in his way, as I even think about this now, it's like, it's like, it's not yelling, I need your eyes. It's just like his hand gently lifting my chin. Like, I need your eyes again, man. I need your eyes. Look at me. Look at me. And as we look at Jesus in his word and in worship and in community and prayer, things happen. We begin to think that we're like surrounded that, that the presence of God is greater than the presence of our storm. We begin to think things like there's, there's no weapon formed against me that shall prosper. We begin to think things like the Alpha and the Omega, the one who has defeated death, will surely have the last word in this situation. We begin to think that this is not it, that Jesus is coming back and he is renewing all things and that what is happening here is real, but it's not forever. What is forever is that eternal weight. We begin to think and see the shore. And so I'm going to pray that that happens even now as we sing and pray and let these words wash over you. Father, would your Holy Spirit come and fall upon us? And as we worship, would you part the fog and let us see what either we need to see from our memories of you or we've never seen before. Christ, in your name, amen.